And Father God, that's why we're here this morning. We've come together to adore you, the Lord. What a great song. Father, as we worship you here this morning, would you meet us in this place? Fill us fresh with your spirit. Give us your mind, Lord, to look into your word. Would you encourage us, Lord, as we enter into this Christmas season, as we finish off a challenging yet exciting year, Lord, would you build up, build up your church, encourage us, fill us with your spirit. Give us the energy and power that is necessary for life. So go before us, Lord. We want to follow you wherever you lead. We love you. We commit ourselves to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you turn at a distance to your neighbor and say, it is good for you to be here this morning. It is good to see you guys from a distance. <laughs> Let me plug this one in. Maybe that'll work a little better for those of you online. I am got that plugged in it's good for you guys to be here this morning it is a great great sunday good morning guys good morning all of you guys out in the field and more and more of you are just bringing your tents and sitting out by your cars it's got to be so nice way out there just having a little part oh look at that dinosaur that ian has Woo! there you go ian good morning guys man I am so excited to be here this morning. We are starting a new book this morning. It is our final. We have made it. We are at, we're on the very last book of Living the King's Way, looking at Paul's epistles. We've gone through them in chronological order, and we've now come to our very last book. And as we come to this last book, I want, I want you to just think about this year challenging year, exciting year. Has there been a time, maybe not even this year, maybe you have to go back beyond this year, but maybe you have to go back to when you were a little bit younger. Was there a time or has there ever been a time where you felt like something is just absolutely beyond you? You know that feeling? I mean, you know that feeling, man. You just feel like this thing is beyond me, man. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here. I'm, I'm drowning in the ocean. It's just over my head. I can't do it. I started to think maybe it's a Maybe it's a personal issue that's gone on in the home and you just feel like, man, this is beyond me. Or maybe it's a thing going on with our government and you look at the things our government is doing and you just think, man, it's just beyond me. I don't even know where to begin, Lord. What's going on? And I started to think in my own, in my own life, has there ever been a time where I start to feel like things are just beyond me? I remember back when, you know, Pastor Rick is getting ready to, to step down and and we're praying about what's gonna happen and I'm just looking at pastoring a church and I'm just thinking, man, humanly speaking, this is just beyond me. I'm surrounded by, you know, we, our church is so blessed, guys. Pastor Rick, you can't say enough about Pastor Rick. He taught us the word of God. Amen. Let's just let, Let's just remember God's faithfulness with Pastor Rick. I mean, he, taught us week in week out it didn't matter how many people were there wednesday night if there's one person there he's teaching the word of god mm -hmm. and i mean and i'm looking at that and, and coming in and saying there are men and women of god in this church such mature spiritual foundational men and women of god that the lord has just absolutely raised up and looking at that and saying and i'm gonna i'm gonna lead that there's no way lord these men and women are so mature and sound in the faith, and I feel so inadequate. And then for those of you that, I mean, Herlette sent me the picture yesterday. For those of you that remembered uh, and have been watching our devotions on through the week, you know that we were in court on, uh, what was it? It was Friday morning. We've been in court for seven years. <laughs> Falsely accused by Mitch Kale and Holly Huber that we're defrauding the state. We've done no such thing. And it's really hard to say anything because there's all these churches involved. And so they never really talk about Calvary Chapel, Milwaukee. They always talk about the things that New Hope has done. And, and we're just saying, they're saying that was New Hope and they settled. I mean, that's not even, that's not even what, what happened with One Love and with Calvary Chapel Central Oahu. And yet they're sitting there for seven years and have falsely accused us. But, you know, I thought, was it the star advertiser who let, they did a good job. They, they kind of showed both sides of that where our lawyers are saying, man, there's been no such thing that's going on. But I feel like there's, it's so beyond us. 
it always feels like the courts just give the other guys more time and more time and it's just i mean what else what else can be done it's been seven years guys let's have a ruling on this oh no we're gonna we're gonna rule next year in july so next year in july <laughs> we'll see what happens with i mean it'll be a whole other year before we find out what and it feels like it's just beyond me lord i what can i do and then we talk about the building we've we've gotten permits and now we're trying to get a loan and it just feels like a loan is beyond us lord how are you gonna do this and as i looked at all these things and maybe as i'm talking about some of these things that's personal for me maybe you think in your own life and you sit back and you say man eli i can i can relate because there's things in my own life that have felt like it's just beyond me and i want to encourage you this morning because here's the thing we've seen the faithfulness of the lord Every, we've been a church here since 1990. i mean how many years is that it's 30 years that doesn't happen by accident <laughs> That's the faithfulness of the Lord. And I'm just talking about corporately as a body of believers, but I want you to think back in your own life. You have seen the faithfulness of the Lord in your own life. We've seen it. We've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And so, you know, it, with thinking about this background, we come to this book of 2 Timothy, this last book that Paul has written. Paul is facing death. He understands, I'm about to go before Nero, and Nero is going to kill me. I am facing certain death. And so he, he's sitting there, and he's going to die, and it's around AD 68. This is the last book that Paul writes. And here's the challenging thing. It's not only Paul that is beheaded, but Peter... So Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, is going to be beheaded, AD 68. On the very same day, Peter is going to be crucified upside down. The apostle to the Jews and the apostle to the Gentiles are going to die there in Rome on the same day. The pillars of the faith. And they look at this and, and they're saying, who's going who's gonna, to who's gonna go forward? Who's going to battle for the truth, for the gospel? Who's going to move for the Lord in, in this generation? Because Paul, he's not, he's not a dumb guy. He's a very brilliant guy. He starts to look out and he sees there is a Roman government, and maybe this starts to sound familiar, that is now starting to come against the church, starting to persecute the church, starting to say this church, this church is evil. And I wonder if that sounds familiar to us here in America, that we've enjoyed our freedoms that we have. And we start to see a government that starts to say, there's something wrong with these churches, man. They're no, they're no good. They're not coming alongside our agenda. <laughs> they don't want to worship Caesar as God. And so Paul, he starts to see this, and then he starts to look and he says, man, there are false teachers that are infiltrating the church in Rome. Across the Roman Empire, there are false teachers teaching a false gospel, and there are people that are totally oblivious to a false gospel that's being preached amongst them. I wonder if that sounds familiar to us. We look around and how false teaching has crept into the church in the West. This idea of health, wealth, prosperity. This I, there's these radical ideas that have started to creep in that have no biblical foundation. And they're creeping into the church. And Paul's looking around and he's saying, he sees all of these things and he says, who is going to be the one that's going to stand for the truth? Peter and I are gone, man. We're about to be killed for the Lord. We're about to go to heaven. And I mean, they were stoked to see that day. But you sit there and you wonder as Paul is praying in that dungeon, Lord, who am I writing this last letter to? Who is the one, Lord, that you have called to lead the charge in this, with this government that's going nuts? Who's the one that you've called to lead a charge with this false teaching that's going crazy? Who's the one, Lord? And as he's sitting there praying, obviously we see he's writing this book to Timothy. The Lord points him to Timothy and says, Timothy's the one. Paul, Timothy is the one. And you guys remember, Timothy is Paul's disciple. He's a faithful minister in one of the most challenging places to minister. Ephesus, the temple of Diana is there, one of the most idolatrous places in the Roman Empire. Timothy is to be the one that's going to be leading the charge. 
and we think, oh man, that's a great choice because Timothy's Paul's disciple. This is a great guy. But many times we forget about Timothy. And I love John Stott. He brings this to the front. This is what John Stott says. He says, humanly speaking, if we look at Timothy, the choice of Timothy from just a purely human approach, humanly speaking, Timothy was hopelessly unfit to assume these weighty responsibilities of leadership in the church. Why? He was young, going into this position where you have men and women that, that are sound in the faith, that are older than him, more mature than him. He was young. He was prone to illness. You guys remember Paul's letter to this young man, drink some wine. <laughs> Timothy, you are prone to illness. Take care of your body. You are a sickly young man, prone to illness. And probably the most important is Timothy was very timid in his temperament. He was an introvert. He was always wanting to draw back. And Tip Paul always had to encourage this young man, don't draw back, Timothy. Push forward, man. And here the Lord is saying, it's going to be Timothy. He's going to lead the charge when you and Peter are gone. And I think of these thoughts of Stott and maybe Paul sitting there in a dungeon. And I think of this new time. Because we're at, whether we like it or not, our country is entering and, and the world is entering. We're entering a new time. There's a new time that's going to come upon America. And as a new time comes upon America, it's going to come upon the world as a whole. And we start looking at that and, and Paul is looking at this new time of trial and tribulation. But this new time that's coming upon us as a country, we start to look at the things going on, our government. We start to look at the things going on, false teaching. We start to look at the love of people growing cold all around us. And we start to wonder, man, uh, humanly speaking, I am hopelessly unfit to meet the challenges that are going on all around me. I am hope, who's gonna lead the charge with all these challenges? Maybe if you're here this morning and you're looking at these things and you're just saying, man, I can feel overwhelmed. The Lord has a word for you in the book of 2 Timothy. And it starts not in the book of 2 Timothy, but the Lord's message for us, for Timothy, for the church, starts in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. And this is a word for us this morning as we're entering in this time. Zechariah 4, 6 says this, Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord. You want to hear it this morning, church? This is the word of the Lord. And it says to Zerubbabel, but it is a word of the Lord to Timothy. It's a word of the Lord to you. It's a word of the Lord to the church. And this is the word of the Lord, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. That when we look at these things and we see the impossible before us, the Lord reminds us, it's not by your might, it's not by your power that you're going to overcome in these situations. It's by my spirit. That's the message from the Lord of hosts to Timothy. That's the message of the Lord of hosts to Zerubbabel. That's the message of the Lord of hosts to you this morning. It's not by your might. It's not by your power that you're gonna overcome and have victory in the midst of these challenges that are about to come upon us as a nation this new time, but it's by the spirit of the Lord that's indwelling in you that you are going to be able to overcome and meet the challenges ahead. We don't depend on ourselves, we depend on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so, man, as we're filled and empowered with the Spirit, we're going to see there's four messages in the book of 2 Timothy. The first message that we're going to see today is we need to guard the deposit that the Lord has placed in you. Guard the deposit the Lord has placed in you. The second chapter talks about you, there is going to be suffering that's involved in this time that we're headed into. Suffering is, at the church in the West, we have been so blessed. The Lord has been so faithful. We, our country founded on biblical principles. We've been almost immune from suffering as we've followed the Lord. But now as we begin to turn and begin to follow our own way and our own ingenuity, we're going to start to see that suffering is going to come upon those who will authentically stand for the Lord. Suffering will happen to those who want to authentically stand for the Lord. And that's chapter 2. Chapter 3 says you have to continue in the faith. A lot of people start in the faith. 
Paul is going to encourage Timothy, continue in the faith in chapter 4 is proclaim. That we need to proclaim our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we remember Pastor Rick. It was just his birthday a few days ago. He would always tell us from 2 Timothy, Church, you are involved in a great work for God. Whether it's as a church corporately or whether it's you as an individual, you are involved in a great work for God because God right now, whether it's corporately with us as a church or you as an individual in this time, God is doing a great work in you. God is doing a great work in us that we are to proclaim as God's ambassadors the gospel of Christ to a lost and hurting world. That we are to defend the faith from those who would attack it, both those inside of the church and those who come against it from the outside. This is an absolutely amazing call. And so this morning, Paul encourages us, church, individual, you, defend or guard the truth that's been implanted in you. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me. 2 Timothy chapter 1 this morning, I'm reading out of the ESV. Paul begins with his customary greeting and moves into the faithfulness of the Lord. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul begins with his heartfelt greeting to his young disciple. Man, Timothy, you are my son in the faith. And right on in verse 1, what is he looking for? He says, I know what I'm looking for because I'm facing it right now. I'm looking for my hope, the promise of eternal life. I'm about to enter into that promise. I'm about to go into eternal life and we'll be separated for a time. But remember our hope. Our hope is in the Lord that, man, that we are going to be together again. And we're going to see each other. And those who have gone before us, who've loved the Lord. What a great hope. I mean, such verse 1 is such a powerful verse. You could talk about that verse for hours. Just talking about how we are going to see each other again. That death, though could be sudden, it could take time. But man, those who have gone before us in Jesus Christ, we will see them again. I mean, just shocked to hear of Mr. Yoshino. I'm still in shock. But I'm going to see my brother again. Because he is with the Lord. As shocking as it may be for him to be leaving this body, I'm going to see him again. And this is Paul's hope. He says, we're going to see each other again. But presently, God has given us grace and mercy and peace to minister to those who are hurting. This lost and hurting world, God has given us everything we need to get through the challenges of life. The challenges of a new time. His grace, his mercy, and peace that we can navigate together. Remember, Timothy, the faithfulness of the Lord, that God has been so faithful. It's vital for us to think back on the faithfulness of the Lord because if we can remember God's faithfulness, we know that that faithfulness is gonna continue. If he was faithful yesterday, he's gonna be faithful today. If he's faithful today, he's gonna be faithful tomorrow. That there's no challenge that's too great for God. And so here, Paul says, remember the faithfulness of God. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. Timothy had Paul as a spiritual mentor. Paul discipled Timothy, showing him by word and action how to live out the Christian faith, how to follow the Lord. This was a man who prayed for Timothy. He said, I'm, I am going to pray for you. I long to see you. I want to see you. Man, I long. I'm going to. Oh, what great encouragement. Do you have someone in your life that just longs to see you? A Christian man, a Christian woman that wants to spend time with you, that's praying for you that is encouraging you in your faith. And we talked about it a couple weeks ago in the book of Titus, that for men and for women, it is necessary for us to have someone in our lives that's encouraging us to follow the Lord. I mean, here's the thing, it's God at the very right time that brings a mature, older gentleman or lady into our lives that can pour into us, that prays for us. I mean, it's one of those things praying for somebody is so vital. I mean, for me, Mr. San, I knew I, I would pray with Mr. San every week at, at prayer meeting. 
And he would always, Eli, I'm praying for you. And I had no doubt that that was true. Here was a man of God, a pillar of this church, and just saying, Eli, I'm praying for you because I know you need the grace, the mercy, and the peace of God to navigate through this life that we're in. I know you need it because I need it. And this is Mr. San, just this older man who's able to come alongside me and just remind me of the faithfulness of the Lord. That those who mentor us and disciple us remind us that God is faithful. We watch their lives. We can see the outcome of their faith as it talks about in Hebrews chapter 13. Examine those who you are following. See the outcome of their faith and follow that knowing that God is faithful. He's going to do what he has promised. This older generation is living it out because God brings that right person at the right time. He brought Paul into the life of Timothy because God is faithful. And not only that, notice the next thing that God has done. I am reminded of your sincere faith that Timothy had an authentic faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. Timothy grew up in a home with a grandmother and a, and a mother that absolutely loved the Lord. What a blessing that is. So often we take for granted growing up in homes with parents that love Jesus. And here, Timothy grew up in a home with parents that loved the Lord. They were, his, his grandparents were Jewish. His mother was, was a Jew. They, they taught him the Bible. They loved the Lord. And man, we don't know anything about his dad, but it appears that his dad did not follow God. And what an encouragement for those of you moms out here today. God wants to use you in a powerful way. That God is using you as a foundation for eternity in your kids, in your grandkids, in your extended families. That yes, maybe your husband is not following the Lord, but even so, God wants to use you in a powerful way. That you're useful to the Lord to point your kids to Jesus Christ. What a great, amazing task that God has placed before us to raise up our kids to love the Lord. And oh, what does it take? It takes example. I remi I'm reminded of my grandmother. You guys know my grandmother. Right? And both of my grandparents, my parents met in Africa at a boarding school. <laughs> because both of my sets of my grandparents were missionaries. And so my grandmother on my dad's side, when they moved in with us, my parents took care of them. They moved in with us in that house that we're living in now. And my grandmother every day would pray for three things when I was going out to play. Lord, I pray that Eli would not get hit by a car. I mean, I was a little kid back then. Little kids rode their bikes in the middle of the street. That's what we did. We rode our bikes in the middle of the street. We did all kinds of stuff in the street. And when we played football in the street, I mean, you get tackled in the street, you get bruises all over yourself, cuts all over yourself. That was, that was childhood. We would drive all, ride our bikes all the way down to the park. Nowadays, I mean, that's unheard of. The kids are just staying at home, playing on their little devices. We were outside, man. And so grand, my grandma, I pray that Eli would not get hit by a car. I have not been hit by a car. <laughs> the car has not killed me yet, Grandma, man. And she would pray, I pray that Eli would be a pastor and Eli would be a missionary. And I, I would always tell her, Grandma, you are so funny. Don't you know, Grandma, you cannot be a pastor and a missionary. You have to be one or the other. Here's this little, what, eight-year-old kid <laughs> telling his grandma what to pray for. Don't you know, grandma, you can only be one or the other. You can only be a missionary or a pastor. You can't be both. And she would just laugh. <laughs> That's my grandma. And you know grandma prayers, man. You're a kid. You want to go outside? Grandma prayers take 17 minutes. Because <laughs> there's a lot of filler in between those things. <laughs> so, and grandmas talk slower. <laughs> so you're just sitting there waiting, but you know it's coming because they live downstairs. You try to sneak down the stairs and get out the door, but grandma would always hear the door open and somehow she always knew it was you. And she'd pray, moms, grandmas, we cannot underestimate the power of a praying, authentic mom and grandma. The Lord wants to encourage you guys this morning. He wants to use you in a powerful way to impact eternity with your family. He wants to do it. God is faithful to do what he is going to do. We need to be the ones that are praying for our families. I mean, how hard is it? We, won't, we give up. Why do we give up praying for our family? So often we get just get tired of praying because we're like, we don't see anything going on. We were praying for Lorena's dad for years. 
And sometimes you start getting tired of praying for him because you never see any change in the guy's life. And you wonder, man, is anything ever going to happen? And you pray and you pray and you pray. And, and then one day out of the blue, I went to church. What? <laughs> you went to church? The guy's radically saved. He's radically different than, than the man he was before. Blows my mind. And I'm like, Lord, thank you for answering prayer. I grew weary in praying. I want to encourage you guys, don't grow weary in praying for your family. You never know. That You never know. They could be 60, 70 years old. You could have already gone and been with the Lord. And God might bring someone into their life. And they could be radically saved. Never stop praying for your family. Because you never know. Here's the thing. There, there's only one thing that I know about that. God is faithful. Amen. He's going to do what he's going to do. And will not the God of all the earth do what's right? His word will not return void. It's going to accomplish its plan and its purpose in an individual's life. Amen. Pray for your family. Something that you never thought could happen, could happen. Because of prayer. Because God is moving. Pray. There's. We cannot underestimate the blessing of one individual, one saved person in a family can alter the entire destiny of an entire family. Church, if you have unsafe family members, pray for your family. Set the example as Lois and Eunice did for Timothy. Set that example and pray for your family. What a blessing it is. God is faithful. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift, God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Fan into flame the gift that is in you. God's given. Uh, God is faithful. God has given each and every one of us a spiritual gift. Uh, it's, it's, that is what God has done. God is faithful to give each of us a spiritual gift. Therefore, we must fan into flame the gift that God has given us. We can't, what does it mean to fan into flame? It means to go out and use the gifting that God has given you. The gifting that God has given you, the ministry that he's called you to, go out and operate in that. You, you cannot sit on the sidelines. There are so many Christians that sit on the sideline. We cannot sit on the sideline. We have to use the giftings that God has given us and use it for his glory and for our good. Walking and operating in the power of the Spirit. Fan it into flames. Use the gifting that God has given you. Why? I love what Paul says. For God gave us a spirit. You are filled with the very spirit of God. Therefore, use the gifting that God has given you. And notice the spirit of God. It says the spirit that God has given us is not a spirit of fear. God has not given you a spirit of fear. But look at the spirit he's given you. But of power and love and self-control. I love that idea of God not giving us a spirit of fear. The idea there is God's spirit is not a coward. The spirit of God is not a coward. But power and love and self-control. I mean, it's so interesting to me. McGee spoke of fear and cowardice. That there is a difference between having an emotional fear and actually being a coward. And he used the illustration of flying on an airplane. And I could so relate to this illustration because even though my dad is a pilot, I am not a huge fan of flying. My worst, the worst flight for me, Lord's called me to go to Nepal. I go to Nepal. The worst flight for me is the flight back from South Korea to Japan and back to Hawaii. It's the worst flight. That entire flight, it's an overnight flight. It's if you're flying direct from South Korea to Hawaii, it's eight hours. If you're flying into Japan, that's like a two and a half hour flight. And then it's a six and a half hour flight from Japan to Hawaii on the way back. And the reason it's so quick is because there's so much wind up there in the winter time. And that plane on the way back is a Disney roller coaster ride. Actually not Disney, we'll, we'll, we'll take it up a notch. Six Flags roller coaster ride. And it's that like that for six of the six and a half hours of that flight. It is just a roller coaster. And you just sit there and you're going up and down and up and down and up and down. And I tell the team, before we even think about going on the trip, I tell the team, all right, I need to prepare it before you go. The flight back is going to be the worst flight that you've ever flown on. And they laugh at me. You don't know the kinds of flights I've been on, Dr. Pons. She's flown everywhere. 
she flies back on that flight with me. We get off, when you get off of that flight, you just walk down the hallway and everybody's like walking like this. Cause they feel like they're just bumping around on this flight still. And Dr. Paws, she wears a patch so she doesn't get sick. Everybody's throwing up on that flight. There's not a person who's, Dr. Paws won't throw up because she's put the patch on, she's smart. But even she said, Eli, that's the worst flight I've ever been on. <laughs> Every year I, I go on that flight, I hate that flight. I can't stand it. I put my earphones in and it's just worship music and I listen to worship music for six hours. And I just pray the entire time. I know there's no plane that has ever crashed from turbulence, but man, that's, this is gonna be the first one. <laughs> that's what I think in my head. And I pray. And McGee talked about it, so I, so I so appreciate what he says. This is what McGee says. Is it wrong for me to have a fear of flying? Because so often I think, oh, it's so wrong for me to have this. The Lord hasn't given me a spirit of fear. It's so wrong for me to have a fear of flying. And McGee said this, it is, so, is it wrong for me to have a fear of flying? No. It would be wrong for me to stay home. Oh, it's not wrong for me to have that fear of flying. It would be wrong if I let that fear of flying control my life and I stay home because I know that that flight's gonna be the worst flight I've ever been on. Is it wrong for me to have a fear of flying? No, it would be wrong for me to stay home. Overcoming emotions, overcoming fear means not letting your emotions stop you from doing something you know God has called you to do. This is what it means that, that we do not have a spirit of fear. We do not let our emotions stop us from what we know God through his spirit has called us to do. In other words, God does not intend that defeat should be the norm of Christian living. God does not intend that defeat should be the norm of your life. If you are a Christian, God never intended for you to live in defeat. He intended for you to live in power, in love, and in self-control, a sound mind. That God has empowered us through His Spirit. He's given us everything we need for life and godliness. He's given us nothing is impossible for Him. As we follow Him, He produces the fruit in our lives. He's the one that gives us the energy and strength to make it through whatever that challenge is, that flying, or whatever it is that's in front of you that say, man, I am that that makes me scared, man. I'm not, that, I'm not looking forward to that. But if God's called you to do something, you say, I'm not going to let my fear override what God has called me to do. I'm going to go out in faith. I'm going to operate in faith, and I'm going to trust the results to the Lord. It absolutely blows my mind. God is faithful. What encouragement for us today that even in our emotions, because we all have emotions, whether we want to admit it or not, that God works and he overrules in our lives. And we make that choice and say, Lord, whatever it is you're calling me to do, I'm going to walk in faith. I'm not going to pull back. I'm not going to operate in cowardice because that's not the spirit that you've given me. God is faithful. Therefore, therefore, verse 8, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Do not be ashamed of your relationship with the Lord. Do not be ashamed of the cross of Christ. Do not be ashamed of authentic Christians glorifying the Lord. Notice what Paul says, but share in suffering for the gospel. Share which means that there are two people, two, there's a group of people that are going through this together. They are sharing in suffering. That suffering just doesn't happen to one individual, but it happens to a group of individuals. And we're starting to see the church in the West has been very protected by the Lord. But we're getting to a point where we start to look into the future. We start to look at the news. We start to see these things going on in our culture. And we're starting to see, oh my goodness, persecution can come upon the church at any moment. We're starting to be able to see this, that there is something coming out there where we're starting to look and saying, there's persecution that's gonna come upon the church. Church, we cannot be surprised by this. Why? Because Jesus himself says, that you will be hated by all because of me. And we think in our lives, I thought, man, that's not gonna happen in my lifetime. That's gonna happen in my grandkids' lifetime. It's not gonna happen now. Jesus said that 2,000 years ago, that we're gonna be hated by all. And we've waited 2,000 years and we haven't really seen that happen. And we've been so blessed to live in the West. 
We've had these freedoms because we've been founded on biblical principles. And we have these freedoms to worship the Lord. And now all of a sudden, we're starting to see how quickly things can change in our culture and society. And we're starting to say, oh my goodness, persecution can happen tomorrow. If we don't agree and compromise the biblical truth and start saying some of these things are correct and, and aligning ourselves with the agenda of some of these groups and start saying, oh yeah, these agendas are totally biblical. It's totally fine to believe those things because the Bible has nothing to say about it. When the Bible has a lot to say about it and we start to compromise, the ones that do not compromise, the ones that stand firm and are authentic Christians will be hated. And we start to see the violence that has, I mean, the violence that's spread, they just spiraled out of control this year. And we're wondering how, where did all this violence come from? We're starting to see that this can come against the church in a blink. If a church isn't going to sit there and say, oh yeah, all those agendas are right. They're biblical because they're not biblical. And even, I mean, we're starting to see it so clearly, but even Tozer saw it back in his day, 70s and 60s. He's writing about this. He, and we talked about it in our devotional time this week, and I, man, it blew my mind. This is what Tozer said in our devotional time this week. The West, America, the West is true. It pays lip service to Christianity, but selfishness, greed, ambition, pride, and lust rule the rulers of these lands almost to a man. Tozer's looking at the leaders of our country, even back then, and starting to say, man, there's, there's something wrong with the hearts and the leadership in our country. Well, they will now and then speak well of Christ, yet the total quality of their conduct leaves little doubt that they are not much influenced by his teachings. There's leaders even today that talk now and then about Christ. Oh yeah, I, I go to church, I, I take Holy Communion talk and yet you look at their conduct and their lifestyle and you start to say oh my goodness <laughs> you're not much influenced by the teachings of Christ you pay lip service to him but there's not much influence that's seen in your lifestyle all this being true is what Tozer says years ago all this being true still we Christians can sing at the foot of a threatening volcano. If the volcano was threatening in Tozer's day, how much closer are we to eruption today? Tozer sits there and says, as Christians, our responsibility is there at the foot of this volcano, seeing it coming to sing praises to our God. Why? Because things have not gotten out of hand. We look in our culture and we start to say, we believe things are getting out of hand. Tozer would say, you're absolutely wrong. Things have not gotten out of hand. However bad they look, the Lord sitteth king forever and reigneth over the affairs of men. The Lord is still in control. No matter how bad things look, no matter how threatening that volcano is that we are sitting under, God is still king over the flood. He still reigns on his throne and he will do what is right. And he says, persecution's coming, church. You can see it. Tozer saw it in his day. And if Tozer says that volcano is threatening and I see a threatening volcano, how much more today is that volcano ready to erupt? And our responsibility is to sit there and say, Lord, you are king over this volcano. You are in complete control and you are going to see us through each and every trial until you see us home. Why? How can we get through? Notice what Paul says. You only can get through by one way. At the end of verse, there's only one way that you get through. It is by the power of God. There is only one way you navigate through the trials that are all around us, whether it's an individual trial in your life, in your family, in your church, in your neighborhood, in your country. There's only one way to get through. It's by the power of God. This is the only way to get through that God will bring us through with such comfort to a, a soul that can feel overwhelmed that God is faithful, that he will bring us through this erupting volcano until that one day where he recalls his ambassadors home. Because there, be, be, it reminded me, I wrote about it in the Shepherd to the Sheep. I didn't get too much into the history, but we're, we're remembering December 7th is just, what is that? Is that two days? It's tomorrow. It's tomorrow. Oh my goodness. December 7th. Is tomorrow. We remember those who gave the ultimate price in a, in a surprise attack 
there was a surprise attack. And it was so interesting, if you start looking at the history of that, that Japan was supposed to make a formal declaration of war in Washington before that attack happened, so it wouldn't necessarily be a surprise attack, but they did not. They had an error with their machines and they couldn't get, the, they couldn't get their declaration of war over to the United States. I, I think I'm correct. Jim will correct me if I'm wrong. He's the history guy. He's in charge of December 7th Memorial. And so there's a surprise attack, a sneak attack. And I looked at that, it was a dark day. And it reminded me that there's going to be a day, a day of surprise, where the ambassadors are gonna be recalled. There's going to be an opening of hostilities almost. Judgment is gonna come and before the judgment, the ambassadors are recalled. Because that's what happens when judgment is occurring, when battle is starting. The ambassadors are giving their declaration of war and they're recalled back to their homeland. Japan didn't quite make it. But there's gonna be a day when the Lord's ambassadors are gonna be recalled. I'm gonna be recalled. You're gonna be recalled. Those, anyone across this planet that names the name of the Lord Jesus as his or her savior is going to be recalled. Meeting the Lord in the air. The world will wonder, oh, that's a strange thing. Where'd all those people go? What happened? And the hostilities will open. And it's a time of trouble that the world has never seen before. And you guys, well, when we get to the book of Revelation, we'll talk about the time of trouble. And so what comfort it is for us. We, I wrote about it in the Shepherd to the Sheep. I say, come Lord Jesus, Maranatha. This is the end of the book where it says Jesus is coming soon. This time is upon us, church, where Jesus is coming. And we have to be the ones that say, as his ambassadors, am I ready for the return of the Lord? Have I done what he's called me to do? Am I operating in the ministry with the gifting that God has given me? Or am I the ambassador that's sitting back in the room trying to figure out how the typewriter is supposed to work to get to, to send the, the message over to Washington? Am I taking it easy? There's a time of trouble. And the Bible's very clear. The Lord does not, is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And there's a time of trouble that's coming and we can see it. And man, how, how, Eli, you might say, how can you be so sure that there's a time of trouble coming? And I can be sure because God is faithful. Notice what God has done. It says it right there. Look at the faithfulness of God. He saved us. God saved us and called us to a holy calling as his ambassadors set apart from the world, not because of our works. He didn't call us to ambassadorship because we were something great but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. That God had a plan for you. This boggles my mind. God had a plan for you before the entire universe was created. God had a plan and he didn't have the plan for you because you were this great individual, because you were so awesome and any of those things. He said, no, I have a plan to use this man, to use this woman in their, in, in their weakness, gifting them, giving them the Holy Spirit so that they can go and do amazing things in my name, in my power. It absolutely blows my mind that God in eternity past had a plan that he would save us and call us and set us apart as his children and ambassadors. Has his plan ever been thwarted? Has God's plan ever been thwarted? No. And so if God's plan in ages past has never been thwarted, I can have absolute confidence that God is faithful and he will do what he promised. And what did he promise? That he will come again. He said, if I go and prepare a place for you, you can know for certain that I will come again and bring you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. This is... The promises of God are yes and amen. And so what did he do? He came himself. Notice verse 10, what does he say? And which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus. That Christ appeared the first time. That he appeared the first time to do what? Notice what he did. Who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. That he died on the cross for our sins, abolishing death, bringing eternal life at the cross. And that idea of abolishing death, you think, well, we still die. The idea of abolishing death is not that death is, is gone. It's that death no longer has any power. 
It's been rendered inoperative. Where Paul is looking forward and just saying, yes, this body may perish, but I'm going to live forever because I have eternal life. The light of eternity is where I'm going. This body, this flesh may die, but in my being, I will see the Lord. It's what Job would say. You may kill the flesh, but I'm never going to die because our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ took care of that there on the cross. He took my place. He took your place, our punishment on the cross, and our punishment was death, separation from him forever. But he loved us, so he took our place. And the challenge is for us to go and share what God has done in us and through us to a lost and hurting world. And so encouragement for us, go and share about Jesus. Share that he died for your sins, that he rose again three days later, and that he's calling the world to repent. And if you don't know the Lord, you do business with God. It's not something that I can do for you. I cannot make the choice. Your friend cannot make the choice. Your grandmother and your mother cannot make the choice. Your father cannot make the choice. You have to make the choice in yourself and say, I'm going to follow the Lord all the days of my life. I'm a sinful man. I'm a sinful woman. Forgive me, Lord. Thank you for what you did for me, taking my place. Give me the energy and power I need in this time. Fill me with your spirit, God, because I cannot do it any other way. And the Lord is faithful. He says, if he's standing on the door and knocking, if you open that door, he'll come in. If you make the choice, he'll come in and dine with you, that you will have a relationship with the Most High God. And as we have a relationship with the Most High God, he gifts us. And when he gifts us, what does he do? Verse 10 says, in which now he has been... Oh, did I miss a verse? No, I'm sorry, I did verse 10. Verse 11, for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher. That as we come to know the Lord, he gifts us and calls us to ministry. Paul was a preacher, which means he preached Jesus Christ. And he was under God's authority as an apostle, teaching the church the truth. And we might not be apostles. You might not be a teacher. You might not be a preacher. But God has given you a gift. God has given you a ministry. This is what Paul is saying. You have a ministry from the Lord operate in the ministry that God has given you in the strength and power of the Spirit. And as we stand for God, as we operate in the ministry that God has given us in His power, what happens? What happens as we operate in the ministry that God has given us? Verse 12 says very clearly, which is why I suffer as I do. When we operate in the ministry that God has given us, standing as authentic Christians against a world that is going crazy, there will be involved suffering. We will suffer when we stand for Christ, which is why I suffer as I do, but I am not ashamed. Don't be ashamed if you suffer for Jesus. Don't be ashamed, why? For I know whom I have believed. Notice he doesn't say, I know the doctrines that I've believed in. I know the great truths of the word of God. He says, I have a relationship with Jesus. I know who I trust in. I know the man that I'm putting my faith in, the God man, Jesus Christ. I know whom I have believed and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. I am convinced that he is going to guard me and what he's put in me until that day that I see him face to face. Philippians 1, 6 would say very similar. He who began a good work in you will what? Well, what? Complete it. When? At the day of Jesus Christ. When we see that there will be, there's a work being done in you today that will be completed at the day of Jesus Christ. It's not done yet. You're still a work in progress. I'm so thankful that I'm still a work in progress. Thank you, Lord, because there's still a lot of work left to do. <laughs> there's still a lot of work left to do in this body. Lord, continue that work. But there's going to be suffering that's going to happen. We will suffer. Don't be ashamed of the Lord. You know who you have believed in. It's not, a, it's not just knowledge. It's the God-man Jesus who gave his life on the cross for us. I mean, we've seen his example that he set and this Emmanuel, God with us, which is why we celebrate Christmas, the greatest gift. Don't be ashamed. He will guard us until that day. He is faithful to do what he says he's gonna do. And so what are we to do? Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Follow the pattern. 
Look for those older gentlemen, those older ladies that are more mature in the faith than you and say, how are you living your life? I want to follow the pattern of God's word in you. As you read God's word and obey it, I want to watch how you do it so that I can follow the pattern that you set. And that's why it's so vital for the for the, those of us, and I was joking with Phil this morning, those of us that have gone past that hill of 40, and we're kind of going down the other side now, it's vital for us to set the example, to show the young generation that you can hear from the Lord by reading his word. You can show the young generation how vital it is to be praying for your family, to be praying for your friends, to be praying for your neighbors, to show this younger generation that God works in powerful ways when his people will pray. Guys, it's so vital for us to set so that they have to be able to follow the pattern. We have to, who sets the pattern? The older generation sets them. Those that are more mature in the faith. And there might be young guys that are very mature in the faith. Set the pattern. Paul will tell Timothy later, you set the standard. Even in your youth, you set it. Maybe there's not any older guys or older ladies setting it. You set it. Don't let that be a hindrance to you. Set the example. Follow the Lord. We have to operate in that way. I mean, and you might start saying, oh my goodness. How, Eli. How can I set this pattern? How can I show faith, belief, and obe obedience when I, when I fail all the time? How can I show authentic love towards God and towards others that are in Christ Jesus when there are people that I just do not love? Because <laughs> there's people in our lives where we find it challenging to love. It's easy to love those who love you, but what about those people in your life that don't love you? Are you setting the example of Christ? Whew. That's tough, man. You might start looking at that and say, Eli, the task is impossible. It's beyond me. Notice what Paul says. He knows it's impossible. Verse 14, he says, by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> he says, this is only one way. If this is possible is by the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Guard the word of God that's entrusted to you. Guard it only through the power of the Spirit. Don't let the enemy come in and snatch what God has given you. Because the enemy wants to get in there. The enemy wants to make you ineffective. He wants to move you off of your foundation of Jesus Christ. We cannot. We cannot give in. We have to be the ones that say, I'm going to be dependent on the very Spirit of God. Because it's by His power that I'm able to overcome because He's overcame. And so only by His power am I able to overcome. And this is the whole point of chapter 1. It's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that we're able to succeed and have victory in life. I want to have victory in life. I don't want to sit back and walk in defeat. I don't want to let my emotions overcome what God has called me to do. I want to walk in victory. And church, it's not by your might that you walk in victory. It's not by your power that you walk in victory. It's not by anything that's in you. It's by the Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. The only way that we can walk in victory, the only way that we can guard that which has been entrusted to us, the Word of God that's been implanted in your hearts, the testimony that you have of what God has done, how has He been faithful in your life, that testimony that God has given you, that's yours from the Lord. No one else has the testimony that he's given you. Because God's worked in you in a different way than he's worked in your neighbor. And that blows my mind that he works in different ways. And yet the result is the same. That we bring him all the honor, praise, and glory. This is the point that we must live in the energy and power of the Spirit. God is faithful. And as we live in the energy and power of the Spirit, there's one sad thing that happens. And every single one of us knows this is true. As you live in the energy and power of the Holy Spirit, there's going to be people that are around you. There's two groups of people that will be around you. Notice what Paul says, verse 15. You are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygellus and Hermogenes. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Anisiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you well know all the service he rendered at Ephesus. 
Paul says, as you authentically follow the Lord, there's going to be two groups of Christians that are around you. There's one group of Christians that's going to turn away from you. They're going to want nothing to do with you. They're going to say, you've failed, man. You're done. They're going to turn their backs. And when that happens, and maybe you've had it happen to you, you understand the heartbreak that's involved in that. When those who call upon the name of the Lord turn away from their brothers and sisters in Christ, and it just leaves a void. It's tough. But God's able to overcome even that. And in the midst of those times when people turn away, guess what? There are going to be people that will stand by you. And here, all these people have turned away from Paul except for one. He says there was one guy who was in the dungeon. And there was one guy. He didn't let the bureaucracy, he didn't let anything hinder him from coming and standing by me. There's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And here he is. And when you have a man like that, when you have a lady like that, that's in your life, how refreshing it is to have a brother or a sister in Christ that you know will stand by you thick and thin. People might be calling you names. People might have turned their back on you, but you have a brother, you have a sister that you know they are going to be there. When I need somebody, they're going to be there for me because they're filled with the same spirit that I'm filled with. It's so vital. I want to be a friend like that that's going to stand by a brother, a sister in Christ was they're going through the challenges of life because there's so many of us that go through challenges of life. And it can be such a simple thing to encourage a brother, just say, I'm praying for you. How can I pray for you? Is there something that's going on? Do you need help? How easy it is for us to give help, to help the cases of urgent need as we heard about last week. Guys, how easy is it for us to do it? But so often we just, we're too consumed with what? With our own things that are going on. I'm too consumed with my own things. I'm not going to worry about it. Guys, we have to be the ones that encourage others. We have to be the Anisophoruses of the world that come alongside our brothers and sisters in Christ and point them back to the Lord and say, God is faithful. Church, God is faithful. In this day of challenge, remember whom you have believed in. Remember who is sitting on the throne. There might be a president, there might be a prime minister, there might be a king of or queen of England, there might be any number of dictators. I don't believe in those guys. <laughs> those aren't the guys that I've believed in. I believed in Jesus. I know whom I've believed in. And I know who I've believed in is faithful and he's going to bring me through each and everything. Even in the midst of a threatening volcano, I'm going to worship the Lord because I know that he's going to he's in control and if God takes me home in the volcanic eruption that is going to happen amen take me home lord because that means the work is done but if God brings me through I'm going to continue to glorify the lord with each and every fiber of my being until that day that he brings me home remember whom you have believed in guard the deposit that God has placed in you the word of God guard the truth in your life do not compromise church do not compromise the truth of God be filled with his spirit remember God is faithful he's not intending you to live in defeat and in cowardice he's intending to you to live in victory and power that's his intention walk filled with the spirit he and where did he give us the victory that's why I love that Roy built this stand for us right here because I look out into creation I look out and all creation cries out. God is real. God is good. God loves you. It's what creation is crying out this morning. I don't even have to say any words. You can just look and see for yourself. There's a good God that made this place for you to live, to enjoy life to find him, to grope for him and find him. And how did he, he said, you couldn't do it yourself. So I'm, you know what, I made a way for you. And that's why I love this cross is right before it all. That the way to the Lord is through the cross of Christ. And it's vital for us to remember that victory is found at the cross. 
victory is found at the cross. And so as we start this last book of, of living the king's way, what it looks like to live the king's way through the Pauline epistles, we need to remember our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because living the king's way is to be filled with the spirit of God, to walk in victory that he gave us at the cross. And so this morning, we're going to have communion together. The ushers, if you could get the elements. And I want you to think, as, as we focus in on the cross, I want to ask you one question. This year, 2020, there's been 11 full months in the year of 2020. I want you to think back and ask the Lord to bring to your mind one thing, one thing that he's been faithful to you in the year of challenge. What one way has God been faithful to you? And here's what I want. I don't just want you to think about it. There's a little, in your bulletin, there's a little paper that just says notes for the Sunday service. Take out a pen. After you've meditated on it, take out a pen and just write, write it down. There's, you remember 10% of the things that you think. You remember 50% of the things that you write. And you remember like 100% of the things that you memorize. If you just think it, the enemy's going to snatch that away from you as you leave this place this morning. I want to give you a fighting chance. I want to give you a 50% chance to remember this because it's vital for us as we go through this week to remember how God has been faithful. Because if we can remember how God has been faithful, we're going to have confidence that he's going to be faithful tomorrow. In the midst of a volcano that we're looking at, we can have faith, we have confidence in a faithful God. I want you to just write down what is one way that God has shown you his great faithfulness this year. Meditate on that and then thank him. And then we'll thank him for the cross together. Ushers, you guys can pass out these elements and Jim, if you can lead us in the song. For me, it was, I think it's so funny. It's been a challenging year and in the midst of challenging years, the enemy likes to attack. And some of you might know a little bit about that, about the fiery darts of the enemy. And you ask, well, Eli, how has the Lord been faithful to you this year? And for me, it was 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. That every one of us, we go through something that's common to all of us. The attack of the enemy is common. It, it happens to everyone. God is faithful. God has shown himself faithful to me this year. And this is what it says. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. What does that mean? Because so often the temptation's beyond my ability. But the ability, he's talking about being filled with the Spirit. And nothing's beyond the ability of the Spirit that's still dwelling in you. It's not beyond his ability. But with the temptation, he will provide the way of escape. That you may be able to endure it. And why does he say that? Because some temptations and trials, and some of you know this very well, they last for a season. And sometimes that season lasts a long time. But this is what the Lord says, I'm faithful. I'm gonna give you everything you need to be able to endure how short or long that trial is. And so for me, if you were to ask me, Eli, what did you write down? I wrote down 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Because it was a reminder to me that God is faithful in the midst of those challenges of life. Because I've had challenges this year, man. It's been a year of some challenge. And I'm sure that hopefully that speaks to some of you this morning, just to remind you God is faithful, church. And whatever it is that you wrote down, I think it's so vital for you to remember. Because if God was faithful yesterday, and if God could be faithful through the challenges of 2020, God can be faithful in 2021. And so, you know, it's all why? Because of this, that we're remembering this morning. It, it wasn't my ability that brought me through 2020. It had nothing to do with me. <laughs> it had everything to do with Jesus. Everything to do with Christ on the cross. And, and Paul says it in 11.23, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And we remember the Lord. And it's vital for us as Christians to look back and say, 
I'm not here because of how smart I am or how good I am or maybe some of the things that I've done. I'm here because Jesus died. That's why I'm here this morning. And the Lord's brought me through each and every trial and each and every circumstance to this point. And it's all because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And I can't thank the Lord enough for what he did for me on the cross and what he did for you on the cross. This is the best gift that's, that, and it's so vital for us to remember the gift that God gave us. The gift was his, himself. He didn't give us, I was talking with Sean yesterday, he didn't give us a junk gift. He gave us the best gift the best gift ever, Jesus Christ. So Father, we thank you for the gift that you gave us, Emmanuel, God with us, God to the rescue, that you saw our condition and you were so faithful. You had a plan before eternity, before time began, in eternity past, you had a plan and you worked that plan out to perfection. Nothing has ever thwarted your plan and nothing ever will. And so Lord, we this morning we look back on the cross, that we're here because of what you did for us on the cross, that you've died for our sins, that you gave us a relationship with the Lord Most High, that you have granted us access, <laughs> that we can come boldly before your throne of grace to find mercy and grace and help in time of need. And Lord, there's a time of need. I know there's people here this morning or watching online, Lord, that there's a time of need in their life. And Lord, I pray that because of the cross, because of your blood that was shed, Lord, that we have access, that we could come boldly and Lord, make our requests known to you. Lord, and would you give us your peace? Would you touch us even this morning? Lord, we thank you for what you did for us on the cross. And we, we give you all the honor, praise and glory. We throw our crowns at your feet and say, Lord, we wanna worship you with all that we are. So go before us this morning, God continue your faithfulness, your great faithfulness to us. Lord, we look to your promises that they're sure and that we hope in you. We love you in Jesus' name. You guys can take the bread together. Paul continues and says, in the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father God, we proclaim your death. We proclaim that you, <laughs> that it's only through you, only through the death and resurrection of Christ can there be salvation. Salvation is found in no other name except the name of Jesus. We thank you for your blood that was shed. Lord, we stand here, we sit here this morning on this piece of property that you have so graciously given to us and we proclaim your death, but we also proclaim, Lord, this morning that you are coming again and we will be with you in the air. Lord, we will be with you in eternity for where you are, there we will be also. It is a promise, it is sure. And Lord, we look for our hope and our hope is in you. We know whom we have believed in. We believe in Jesus. So Lord, do that work, that work that you began in us. Lord, would you complete it? Would you continue it and complete it until that day we see you face to face? Help us, Lord, to not live in defeat. Help us, Lord, to not live in cowardice, but Lord, help us to live in power and love and self-control. Lord, because you are our God, we're your ambassadors. Lord, plead through us. Use us in a powerful way today, this week, Lord. We commit ourselves to you. We thank you for the cross. Lord, give us all the energy and power. Fill us fresh with your spirit, Lord, for everything we need for this week. So we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can have the cup together. I think it's so good of us to start each month with communion. And next year, January, the first Sunday in January, I think it's January 3rd. We're gonna do something a little bit different. We're gonna have communion together. We're gonna to have, it's gonna be a special service as we start a new year, because it's gonna be a new time. You know, we're, we're, we've been praying, the elders and I have been praying about what God has put on our hearts for next year. And we've had a talk with some of our, some of the people here in the church, but God's gonna move us in a, in a direction. He's moving us in a new direction. It's gonna be an exciting time. And so as we work through uh, December, 
It's a great month. I'm excited for this month. And I'm excited for what? Let's be excited because God is doing something exceedingly abundantly above anything we can ask or think. And he's using you to do it. And that blows my mind. So be encouraged this week. God is using you in a powerful way. And so why don't you guys stand with me? We'll sing a last song. We'll see you in studies this week. If not, we will see you next Sunday right here on the property. Have a great week in the Lord.